You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Hello, I'm Maisha Kai, host of the Griot's Writing Black Podcast. In West African tradition, to be a griot is to be a storyteller, one who carries and communicates the experiences and legacies of a people. As the Griot's lifestyle editor, I've always been fascinated by how we tell our stories. That's why we launched Writing Black, to explore the myriad ways Black writers craft stories and communicate our experiences. Thank you for joining us. Here's an excerpt from this week's guest. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Samaria Johnson. I didn't really come out. Like when I hear young people talking about, I gathered everybody in the living room. <laughs> Excuse me, I have something to say. Y'all calling me crazy when a bitch been popping off that like crazy. I asked the hard question. Do you think I'm an alcoholic? Um. If I only freeze my head, is it like cheaper? It is cheaper. It's a broke people thing to only freeze your head. That's right. That's a whole nother episode. Oh. A whole nother episode. <laughs> I cannot be more excited to have this guest on because this is somebody who gets a lot of play in my household. So I am very excited to have Sam Jay with us today, who is one of my favorite writers as, uh, you know, someone who's written in multiple mediums. You know, you're, you, you've done stand-up, you've done TV, SNL, um, your own vehicles. I, I, you know, I just thought you were such a perfect person to have on and, and you know, uh, as this podcast airs, you will have just wrapped your second season of Pause with Sam J on mm-hmm. HBO. If y'all are not watching this, you should be because it's hilarious. <laughs> so, Sam, how are you? And, uh, you know, how, how, is this, how has this season been for you? Uh, I guess I'm pretty good. I'm glad that the season is winding down. Um, <laughs> I need a break, so it'll be nice to kind of not be so worried over the episodes and get a little space from it to also kind of think about what I want to do next season. And I don't know, I, I guess I feel good about the season. It's kind of hard when you're, you're, you're immersed in it to feel anything, but just kind of consumed by it. But I feel like the reception has been good and people are, are like, taking to it and, and really starting to connect with, with what, what the show is. Well, I mean, the show is really, um, I mean, the reason it gets so much play in my household, I really think you, in addition to just being a naturally hilarious person who surrounds yourself with hilarious people, um, you know, you are doing this sort of cultural commentary that I think is a little different <laughs> than what we're used to seeing. It's, it's refreshing. It's, um, it's very rooted. I mean, it's very rooted in the way that we speak to each other culturally, like as Black folks, you know, you have a predominantly Black crew of folks around you, which is one of the reasons I really wanted to have you on as well. Because, you know, I don't know that we've, this is something new that we, I think we've seen in the last few years in terms of getting a more realistic lens on how we speak to each other. You know, I mean, I know you work with Prentice Penny. Um, Insecure was a hit for a reason, and I would say the same about Pause. So how did Pause come about? Like, how do you all sit together and say, okay, this is what we want to do a show about? Like, how did, how, what was the genesis of this? Um, honestly, I got linked up with Prentice through, like, some, some agents and my manager. And we've had a couple of meetings and just, like, talked to each other and just figured out if we would vibe at all with one another um, as people. And we, we vibed as people. And then, you know, we started talking about what a late night show could be. And it was just a lot of conversations really at first about more so what we wanted the show to feel like, even before we kind of started talking about what it would look like or like what it could be. It was just like, what what type of thing are we trying to put out and what are we trying to get out of what we're trying to put out? Um, and I think just over time, you know, and, and once we really started like getting in the writer's room with it, and working on different iterations of it, the iteration we have kind of just grew out of development, really. You know, I love that you brought the writer's room because I think that's something that not a lot of us are privy to. You know, we hear about them. Um, You've been in some pretty legendary ones already in your career. Um, But one of the things that's really cool, I think about Pause in particular, is that, I mean, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I always get the sense when I'm watching it, because you're surrounded by so many other industry folks and other 
comic voices, some of which, you know, are very recognizable, some of which we may not know. Um, it kind of gives that feeling, like it kind of gives me the feeling of a writer's room. Is that, was that the vibe you're going for? The vibe we were going for more so is just how conversations actually happen. Who's that word? And this bitch was like, I want to get Bantu knots, but I don't want to hurt black people's feelings. Oh, and I'm like, why do you think you have the power to rock my day? You just look dumb. <laughs> That like open floor dialogue that seems to happen at a party or when you're hanging out with your friends where people are a little have their guards down and they're not trying to say the perfect thing, but they're just saying what they actually feel about something. And we were just trying to capture that as much as we possibly can. Um, and I think by coincidence, you know, comedy writers rooms typically work the same way as that. Um, but I, I don't know that that was like the forefront in our mind of like, it needs to feel like a writer's room. Honestly, we were just like, it needs to feel like a party at my house. And I, I work in comedy and I work in comedy writing. So typically at my house, there's a lot of comics and, and writers and people like that if I if I throw a function. But mixed with my family and my friends who have regular nine to fives and all that stuff. And like, that's what we tried to uh, bring to pause was just like a bit of a hodgepodge of like people in my life. Well, you you also are very much inviting us in as as guests at that party as well. So it's it's always a really um, it's always a really good time. <laughs> I would say that. Um, and you also, you know, the vibe is fun, but you're hitting on some really like, I mean, you know, for back, lack of a better term, some some pretty serious. <laughs> you know, you just are. You know, um, one of the. Um, one of my favorite episodes actually was about sexual miscalculations. I thought that was a really great way of phrasing that. And it's something I think about a lot. Um, you know, the politics of consent, the fact that consent has become very politicized, all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, you know, when you're sitting around like brainstorming about these topics, like, you know, is this really, are these just areas of discomfort? Are these things that people are, you know, have brought up to you that you're like, oh, you know, you know, you sit around and list these things. I'm really interested in the process of how you how you decide you're going to delve into these topics further and who you're going to invite to discuss. Um, I mean, really, it's just more so like we just talk in the writers' room and the things that kind of everybody grabs onto and has an opinion on. We kind of keep pushing towards those things. I mean, I think it's it's a and it's kind of a combination. Some of it is stuff I know I want to talk about. You know, like I come into the season. And I'm like, here's a conversation I, I want to have because I haven't seen it had in this way. Mm -hmm. um, I I think we choose things uh, based on if we have something to contribute to it. I don't like to just talk about things because it's the thing to talk about of the week or it's the thing everybody's talking about right now. Like if I don't actually have a real opinion or or anything to add to the conversation, then we typically steer, steer away from things like that. But um I, when it came to the uh, sexual miscalculations of it all, I just felt like I've I've never had heard that conversation being had in a very just kind of like open and honest way from both sides of it. And say no, but also I'm giving you all of the signs that say stop. It's usually a very heated line in the sand conversation. Mm -hmm. And there is so much gray that I just don't think gets addressed. And so we were like, hey, maybe a conversation around the gray of it all. And this is always usually stuff that I've talked about in my personal life or been sitting around with my homies and been like, yo, this is, this is that, or that is this. And like, why aren't we ever hearing anybody talk about this part of it or that part of it? And then that's kind of how we choose stuff. You know, again, that was an episode that for me, I mean, those are conversations I have, you know, with my friends as well. I love the fact that you leaned into like the gendered aspects of it. I just thought like, you know, the nuance of it all that is then couched in this really casual, often really hilarious conversation is is kind of a marvel to behold. Um, is it true? I did a little wiki, wiki research here, and you know we can't always depend on wiki for everything. So, <laughs> is it true that you started stand up a decade ago? Uh, I was twenty nine. Yeah, I guess I feel old, but yeah, I guess twenty nine. Wow. I mean, because I look at like what you've accomplished in a decade here as a writer. Um, you know, writing for SNL. I mean, Black Jeopardy, you're part of, like, that's a, that's a Sam, you've been involved in some of these, like, iconic moments that pop culturally, you know, all of us <laughs> identify with, right? Um, does that ever feel overwhelming? No, I don't really think about it. Um, 
it's just always stuff to do, you know, like with the Black Jeopardy of it all, you know, that was already a thing when I got there. You know, Che okay. and, and Tucker have been doing it. You had the Tom Hanks one. Yeah, just jammed down with the Tucker and, and, and Che on, on two of the joints. And that was fun. And it was cool. It was a good time. Um, but I don't know. It's just I, I don't really spend too much time dwelling in that stuff because it can get overwhelming. Yeah. So I try to just, yeah. you know, focus on what's ahead of me. Yeah. And I, I, you know, just to be a little clear about what I meant by overwhelm, I guess I think of, you know, also being a writer myself, producing a podcast, all those kind of things that we mm-hmm. do, trying to juggle those things. And I'm not doing it at anywhere near the scale you're doing it. And I, I get overwhelmed, you know. And I think, you know, when we talk to writers, a lot of it is so much about like, where do you find the time? Where do you where do you carve this out? You know, where do you find this space to be creative sometimes? Because Obviously, the more in demand that you are, the more difficult it becomes to even just have a life. So um, I think that's kind of what I was more leaning into, I guess, a little bit in terms of the with that name recognition. Does it some do you find that you have to become more structured in the way that you approach the craft? I think I'm just realizing that. Um, mm. Honestly, I feel like I actually just thought about it for the first time this morning. <laughs> uh was worried to yes for that because I woke up this morning and I was like, I may have to create a schedule because things are starting to just pile up and, you know, I don't know that I'll get to everything and give it its due diligence if I don't start making it more like structured, though I don't, I'm not really that way. I don't really approach things like that. I'm pretty loosey goosey. Yeah, same. When it, <laughs> when it comes to stuff and creating stuff, um, but I was like, man, I might have to start getting up at like eight o'clock and, and dedicating like an hour to this and an hour to that and blah, blah, blah. Um, so I don't I don't have a firm answer yet, but I'm I'm just starting to think about it, I guess. Listen, I mean, that was actually why I asked, you know, because I know how it is as a creative. Like it's it's hard because we like to be loosey goosey. We like to you know, let inspiration strike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But as we know, more money, more problems, more schedules, more, you know, all that good yeah, stuff. Yeah, it just becomes like a necessity <laughs> to some degree. Right. But right. I guess I'm, I'll find a rhythm that it won't, because if it's too structured, I know it won't work for me. Mm-hmm. I've never worked like that. I was never like a comic who was like, I got to get up and write for an hour every day. I don't do that. I kind of just write all day and I'm thinking all day and I'm tooling things around and moving things around in my brain all day long. Um, so it's, there's gotta be some middle ground where I won't lose that, but it's not as loose as it's been. So speaking of comedy, um, so we've, we've covered that this, this whole career, this amazing and still growing career of yours has been a decade's worth of work. And we know a lot of stuff happens before people become overnight successes, uh, so to speak. Um, what, when did comedy make sense to you? I mean, like when, when, like, did you just wake up one day and say, hey, you know, I really want to do stand up. I really want to just like, you know, get up in front of people and riff. Um, like what, what happened? I mean, I think I was always kind of one to do it. And then thinking about it and I had like, I'd like tried it in my early twenties and then went off and did a bunch of other stuff. And I don't know, I was getting to my thirties. Uh, well, my, I was about to turn 30 and, uh, just not feeling like I was living to my potential, honestly, and just trying to, you know, figure out why that was, <laughs> what what, <laughs> what were the blocks and what was going on, to why I was kind of in a rut in life. Um, and comedy was like the one thing that I was, I wanted to do, but I was scared to do, kind of. And so I just kind of, you know, took it head on and was like, let me try it. And see, it was really like a what do I have to lose feeling of like, I want to know and I'll regret if I never try and I don't find out and what's the worst that could happen, you know, I'm bad at it. And then like, I go do whatever it is I'm already doing, you know what I mean? It just felt Mm -hmm. like what what could be the worst scenario wasn't too bad in, in, in retrospect. So, um. I just kind of went for it. I mean, I think that's such a, A, it's such a refreshing answer. And I think it's, you know, 
it is that thing. What, I don't know that we're asking that enough of ourselves sometimes. Like, what's the worst that can happen? You know, and you're thinking, oh, I could fall flat on my face. I could humiliate myself. I could do whatever. But that regret factor that you talk about, I think, is, is definitely got to be the overriding emotion when it comes to pursuing or not pursuing something. And um, yeah, I, I love that answer. Um, you know, I, uh, <laughs> I also have a soft spot in my heart for another vehicle you're involved with, which is Bust Down. I have a feeling that the reason I'm, I'm so soft on this is that I can literally see Gary, Indiana from my apartment. I live oh, in Chicago. Uh... <laughs> so, so I'm like, this is not all altogether unfamiliar to me. Um, how did this come about? How, but this show is ridiculous, first, <laughs> first of all. But like, what, 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 what happened there? What, what, how did this come together? I mean, way before you and I was at SNL, Chris Langston, Jack and I were working on it. And um, it's really just a labor of love that we have been working on for a long time. And um, it lived in a few places at Hulu, at Netflix at one point, and kind of bounced around, but we never gave up on it. I can't believe you didn't help me. You watched her pour mango margarita on my head. No, I left before that. And it just didn't seem right to get involved in a domestic violence situation. It wasn't a domestic violence situation, bro. We don't even live together. It was just regular violence, you dumbass. We really wanted to do this thing together. And so we all kind of just kept it at the tip of our tongues and and in conversation and never really left it hanging, even though we were all kind of getting our own things. You know, Jack had gone into Big Mouth and Langston was on Southside and the boys and Chris SNL and I was at SNL and then pause and just like all the little stuff we were just doing, but we just really wanted to make Bust Down um, (laughs) uh, because we just thought it was going to be a good, fun, silly time. And uh, it was, it was a good, fun, silly time. Well, I can't wait to hear more. Stay tuned for more from the Writing Black Podcast. The Grio Star Stories with Tere, coming soon on the Grio's Black Podcast Network. Welcome back to the Writing Black Podcast. You know, one of the things I do think, and you know, we were touching on this a little bit earlier uh, when we were talking about the format of pause and this kind of like party atmosphere that you create. Um, And even, you know, talking about Prentice and and the kind of projects that he's become uh, synonymous with. But it seems to be a really, really exciting time to be a Black creative and particularly a Black writer, a uh, Black content creator, if you're working in, you know, television, et cetera. a lot of people have definitely, you know, coined this time the new renaissance. How does it resonate for you kind of being able to not just bring yourself to the proverbial table, but do it with your friends? Do you know, have these communities of folks who are just like, you know, bouncing ideas off each other and actually being able to make them happen and um, maybe... <sighs> I don't know. Do you feel that same sense of gatekeeping or do you feel like some of that's breaking down a bit? I know that's a layered question there. Um, I don't know. You know, like, I don't know. It's tough because I think things have as much power as you give it sometimes, you know, and I've never been a big believer in gatekeepers and that that system in itself I, I mean you go through that when you start a stand-up there's a there's a lot of gatekeepers even locally before you can go and do anything nationally you know just trying to break into your local clubs network and all that you know there's always dudes who are telling you what the do's and don'ts of comedy are and how long it takes to do this and what it requires to do that. But like, there's no one way to, to do anything. And most of the time, like those those people don't even really know what they're talking about, especially like when you're dealing on a local level, a lot of the times you're just, you're dealing with someone who hasn't necessarily left your hometown, but is telling you what it takes to like make it in LA. So it's like, you have to put all that stuff into perspective. You know what I mean? Um, so when it comes to like the industry itself, I I just didn't, I just focused on making cool things and working with people I liked. And I've had success that way. That's all I know. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I I, I didn't really fall into that whole thing. And I'm not to say it doesn't exist. 
I just don't know that I gave it that much of my my time or energy. I just feel like, you know, you're going to hear a lot of no's Mm -hmm. as much as you're going to hear yeses. That's just the nature of it. Everybody's not going to like you and everybody's not going to get you. And at the end of the day, when you're out here selling something, you're selling something and someone's buying it and they're buying it because they feel like it's an investment. And at the end of the day, they hope that it will help them sell ad space because they are a business and that's what they're in the business of doing. Um, and if they don't think your thing will do that, that's fine. Uh, there's a lot of places to sell things to and like there's a lot of ideas. So I don't know. I just kind of live by that and just do the things that feel good and do the things that feel correct for me and work with the people that I feel get me as an artist and like get the things that I'm trying to do. And yeah, that's just how I choose to play the game, I guess, you know, and you can, so I don't know if it's like a relaxing thing or a not thing or people just giving some, some stuff too much like, weight that just doesn't really have that much weight at the end of the day you know what i mean Mm -hmm. i hear a lot of times people say things like oh this is the new way and if you don't have a bunch of followers then you can't do this and if you don't have this which are all these new like gatekeeping rules right but i don't i don't i don't i'm not necessarily the most twitter savvy person i don't (laughs) i don't have a lot of followers probably have twenty four thousand followers maybe you know I don't, I'm not over a hundred K on Instagram and like, I don't get that many retweets and like stuff like that. (laughs) I just try to make cool stuff, you know, with my friends. Um, So I don't know. I think it's a little bit of like it, 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 it's how much you play into that too. You know, not to say I haven't had people do that to me. You know, I don't want to, I don't want to paint that picture. I've definitely had some opportunities where, or I've gone to some meetings and they've been like, yeah, you need to get your followers up. You need to do this and you need to do that. And then we can get you all these opportunities. And I just walked away from that kind of stuff because I was like, well, that's just not for me. I'm not that type of person. I'm not, that's not how I'm going to do this. So I have to find another way that's going to work for me. You know what I'm saying? I do know what you're saying. I think, I think we call that integrity. I like it. (laughs) But I also think, you know, the same could be said of, you know, identity, right? You know, we've, I think we've both lived long enough. I'm a little older than you, but (laughs) I think we've both lived long enough to kind of see this um, shift and sometimes pendulum swing when it comes to how identity plays a role and in terms of what people think is marketable and when it's not. And you are somebody who, you know, whether you're talking about it, you know, in pause or, uh, you know, bust down, you know, you are very like, candid, you know, you're bringing a lot of yourself to the table, whether it's talking about, you know, being masculine of center or, you know, talking about blackness in very, very candid, you may not get this inside joke kind of terms. Um, Is that something that, is that something that you feel has been a, a, a big key to your success? Or do you think it's something that sometimes people are pressing you to do? Mm, I don't think anyone's pressing me to do it for sure. I just, I just never wanted to make things that weren't authentic to me and that didn't feel like me, you know, and yeah. especially if I'm the driver of it, I just felt like it needs to fit me and, and feel like me. I didn't want to like, if you, if you know my stand up, I didn't want you to watch my late night show and go like, who the is this person (laughs) (laughs) you know what I mean like what's happening I didn't want to put on a suit and sit behind a desk and and be a thing that I'm not so Mm -hmm. with everything that I've made at least up till now I just look at it like how how can I make it fit me and how can I like do this in a way that feels authentic to to my voice I mean and you've created that space for yourself but do you also think of it in terms of like the space you might be creating for other people, does that ever play into anything for you? I mean, not that I mean, it should necessarily, but. Yeah and no, right? Like, mm-hmm. yes, of course, because it's like a, a impossible thing to like not think about when right. you're when you're a, a minority and in, in, in so many ways, you know, black, gay, a woman, it's 
you're going to think about it. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And like, I do try to make sure when I'm doing stuff, I'm I'm making space for people, mm-hmm. you know, like for people who grew up like I grew up and, and, and talk like I talk and move like I move. And like, even when Prentice and I talked about, you know, pause, it was like, I just want this to be something my would watch and, and can go like, yeah, like, that I've had that conversation or yet, like just something where they could see themselves in it. And it is not just like completely foreign. I've been a black woman way longer than I've been a gay woman, but it's like, who decides what you're supposed to align yourself to? And I do think that matters. I do think you have to, you know, kind of move in spaces as authentically as you can, because you make room for people to be themselves and, and not have to put on airs to do things. And if, if you make a show and it, and it works and, you're 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 talking like right away and but it's still some a level of intelligence to it and a conversation everybody can dig into then the next person who comes along with that vernacular in a gold chain may be looked at less like they might not know what the they're talking about you know what i mean so in that regard like sure but i also don't try to think about that at too much because you don't want to start doing things that for, just for that reason, you know, it has right. to be creatively interesting to me and, and drive me personally. And and at some point, you know, if I'm doing it right, everyone should dislike me uh, for one reason or another, if I'm being like a true dynamic person. And so I don't ever want to get like locked into that mode either. Mm-hmm. And in a weird way, if that makes sense, what I'm trying to say yeah, is like, does. and then, you know, it, it can become a little self-righteous if you like OD on that tip. Yeah. So it's like, I, I'm also not trying to play in that lane either of like, I am here for the black women to, do, you know, like, yeah. cause sometimes I'm just doing some Sam <laughs> that, <laughs> cause I just like, <laughs> want to do it. And it, there's nothing deeper than that to it, you know? Well, you know, you, you uh, are definitely an authentic storyteller and I, I, I really admire and appreciate you for that. What What's next? Is there something we can be looking? I mean, we know there'll be no, will there'll be more of pause. So I'm excited about that. Um, what else are, do you have percolating if you can share? <laughs> um, I don't know. Just a bunch of stuff in development and ideas that I'm playing with and okay. things I, you know, I'm thinking about all types of stuff from like cartoons to sketchy things to, so just see what, what, excites me and what feels good what feels right i I can dig it and we ask this of all of our guests so i'm gonna ask you as well you are a storyteller but when you are like who are people that you admire who are also storytellers you know whether it be books or film but people who i guess inspire you as a writer uh michael che Mm -hmm. um i think he's he's a phenomenal sketch writer and a great comic hmm I don't know, so much stuff. There's so much stuff out there, you know what I mean? Um, that I'm always like consuming and stuff. Prentice, uh, Jack Knight. I just think he's such a phenomenal writer, a phenomenal comic and just a great visionary. He did some directing this season. Um, well, he was supposed to, <laughs> but he set up a lot of ideas for some directing this season. He ended up getting pulled into a movie. But, uh, you know, so he's been inspiring me to just in, in the idea of what I can grow to become in this industry and stuff like that. Um, what am I reading, chilling on the side? I haven't read a book in a minute, so now don't get me to lying about that. <laughs> uh, I have started The Water Dancer and I'm just in it, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But I'm not done with it. Um, it's been like a slow read for me. Uh, whoa, you know what I mean? And then I like the classic people that everybody you know, digs and, and, and likes. Just finished Giovanni's Room maybe last summer. And Love, yeah. I had a good time with that. But I think I'm, I'm just catching, like, inspiration from everywhere. All right. Well, you're giving inspiration, too. And we really appreciate you coming on to Writing Black to help us kick this podcast off. And just to really sit and, and glean some of this this authenticity and this brilliance. So thank you, Sam J. Thank you for your time. Thank you for yours. So we've reached the part of the episode where I talk about some of my favorite things to to share with you. Um, but one thing I do want to share with you uh, in regard to this episode is that we had this conversation with Sam J 
uh, just a few days before she lost one of her uh, closest collaborators, Jack Knight. Um, if you don't know Jack Knight, he was an amazing comedian, writer. Um, his stand-up is brilliant. His acting is brilliant. He co-starred with Sam and Bust Down. Um, his writing was all over Pause with Sam J. Um, and just a really, really vibrant, young, fresh, you know, just ridiculously brilliant talent that I'm sure um, a lot of us feel has gone too soon. So uh, we, A, want to pay tribute to Jack Knight. And that, I would, I would say Jack Knight is one of my favorites and, and one of those voices that I wish I could have heard a lot more of. But I highly recommend go to YouTube, check out Jack Knight, and you will get a taste of his writing, his humor, his, his cleverness. Watch Bust Down for the same reason. I will admit, though, that my favorite Jack Knight moment is actually not one that he wrote. <laughs> um, it's a performance, and actually he's animated, so he doesn't even really technically appear in it. But if you watch the animated series Big Mouth, um, I believe that's on Netflix, um, you will hopefully be familiar with a very iconic um, little musical number called Code Switching. And yes, it's about exactly what you think it is. And Jack Knight performs that piece. And it really, to me, is it kind of epitomizes um, the wonderful energy that we were be just becoming accustomed to when, when we lost him. Do I have a code switch? No. How does a code switch work? Well, it's a little tricky, but let me break it down for you. As a black kid, you gotta learn this handy trick of social self-defense. You switch up your speak and give your manner a tweak depending on the audience. I'll be Will Smith, witty, or cool like Diddy, or affable as you please. Cause when you're young and black, you develop a knack for putting the world at ease. It's called code switching. I'll, I'll, I'll love to Jack Knight and Jack Knight's family and his friends and obviously to Sam Jay and partake in his brilliance wherever you can. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Writing Black. As always, you can find us on the Grio app or wherever you find your podcasts. The Grio Black Podcast Network is here and it's everything you've been waiting for. News, talk, entertainment, sports, and today's issues, all from the Black perspective. Ready for real talk and Black culture amplified? Be inspired. Listen to new and established voices now on the Grio Black Podcast Network. Listen today on the Grio mobile app and tune in everywhere great podcasts are heard.